argue that um, Republicans should push through a presidential nominee in the month of December. You know what, I, what I've been wondering, though, all along, Glad, and we've been talking about this, is that, you know, if this process is rushed, and now as there are more allegations, very explosive allegations, if you if if the Republicans rush this process and get the justice that they want on the Supreme Court, will they still have to pay during the midterm elections? This I don't know how Brett Kavanaugh now becomes a Supreme Court justice without an asterisk beside his name, without you know it mm -hmm. being tainted in some way, and that's. You know, that's got to play out in the midterm elections. Anyone who's upset about how this process has unfolded. I mean, one know, accusation or allegation is is bad. Right. Two and now three. And these are explosive allegations. The question then becomes, I mean, is there going to be some sort of pressure, even if we understand that the president doesn't like to lose, even if he believes that it's a con job, even if there are some members of Congress who believe this is a smear tactic by Democrats. But for Judge Kavanaugh himself, what, is, what does Mitch McConnell do? do you, does Mitch McConnell talk to Mr. Kavanaugh and say, look, uh, for the good of the country, for your family, mm -hmm. for the party, this may not be the best path forward. For Mitch McConnell, this is plain and simple a numbers game. As long ah. as he thinks that he can get uh, Kavanaugh confirmed, he is going to stick with him for the reasons that I outlined before. Yes, it's, it's possible that he could take uh, this intangible hit in the midterm elections, but he may feel that that's worth it for the tangible victory of getting a, a lifetime conservative right. on the Supreme Court. Wow. Um, yeah. And then beyond that, you just got. To, and then you know, beyond that, um, the reality for him is the minute that two or more Republican senators, because that's the only that's how many he can afford to lose if all Democrats vote no. The minute that two or more come to him and say, "I can't vote for this guy," then it's over. It's over, and McConnell knows that. And you know, maybe he he has everyone take a vote to show that he doesn't have the vote. Or maybe he decides, okay, well, I don't want to make everyone take a tough vote if it's not going to go anywhere. And then he goes to the White House and says, I can't get him confirmed. But that has not happened yet. Right. So, all right. So um, we've got, Nancy, I hope you can stick around. I know you, uh, uh, clearly we would want to hear from some members of Congress. My guess is they're not going to be doing a lot of press right now while they digest <laughs> mm -hmm. this information. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, right. stick around because we want to bring in now attorney Julie Rendleman. She is joining us on the phone um, to talk us through this. So um, thank you so much, Julie, uh, for joining us here. Um, Anne Marie Thanks pointed for and Marie pointed out that uh, this affidavit that is has been released by attorney Michael Abinadi is submitted under, you know, the, you cannot lie in these. This is, if you do, mm -hmm. then you have, then you can be, uh, this is perjury. It's under threat of perjury. The threat of perjury and she, and she is, is very that. real. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I can see a situation where supporters of Mr. Kavanaugh say, look, these are just allegations. There's no proof. Of this, so what does this affidavit actually mean, legally speaking, when it comes to these allegations and where the burden of proof lies? Well, I mean, first of all, let me just say that I, I, I think we were all waiting because the Avenatti had said I think it was 48 hours he was going to come out with something, and people questioned whether he would, and and he fulfilled his promise. Um, and so, you know, what is this affidavit? I mean, it re lends credibility because it's a sworn affidavit. Um, obviously, there's no chance of cross-examination unless she's permitted to testify like everyone else, which many are going to start to say that she should be testifying as well. I think the big thing about, you know, what she says is that, you know, she refutes not only everything Kavanaugh said when he spoke the other day um, in an ill-advised interview, um, but she <coughs> a lot of details um, in regards to his behavior back then and the behavior of Mark Judge, which corroborates what the main witness is saying, which really, really, I think, hurt Kavanaugh incredibly. Yeah, I was curious what you thought about just the way this declaration is sort of mapped out. I mean, the most explosive part of it doesn't come to the very end, but there's there's definitely something very strategic about she, how she explains how she met Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh, the nature of the relationship, how she observed their the two men, their relationship. What do you make about how it's all sort of laid out? 
Well, it, you're absolutely right. And I think the thing, one of the killer things is when she starts to describe who she is, which is this, mm-hmm. is, this is not just some woman who's coming out of nowhere. This is a woman who's had security clearances, you know, time and time again. You know, this is not someone who seems to have an axe to grind, although remember that, you know, she hasn't been vetted. Um, um, she's been vetted, arguably, by Avenatti, but both sides have a right to vet her to make a determination as to whether or not there's any bias um, or any any reason she might come forward and be dishonest. But I don't think anyone's surprised to hear again from another female that lived at the time when uh, Kavanaugh was younger that establishes that he was a big drinker, that he was a big partier, and that, you know, that drinking led to some abusive behavior towards women. And so I don't think it's a shocker based on what we've been hearing. And I, thir- I certainly think it contradicts incredibly what he's trying to establish himself as today, which he may be very different today uh, than he was then. But it doesn't remove the fact that, that he behaved the way I think it's all starting to sound like he did uh, when he was young. You know, it's interesting um, that Mr. Kavanaugh uh, has uh, this calendar that he says that he has, which in his mind, or at least, which is kind of surprising right. to me that he's this like um, incredible lawyer and that he would say, well, I've got this calendar that I, I guess kept when I was a teenager and it shows all these activities, um, including Beach Week. And what I find kind of interesting is that uh, number nine of the affidavit um, from Mr. Avenatti and uh, from Ms. Swetnick says, I've been told by other women that this conduct also occurred during the summer months in Ocean City, Maryland. I also witnessed such conduct on one occasion in Ocean City, Maryland during Beach Week. Now he in his calendar was suggesting that he was at these beach weeks to right. sort of exonerate him. But what it, I mean, if you were sitting in court, Julie, and somebody presents a, a uh, you know, they're trying to prove their innocence by suggesting that they have a calendar going back to when they were in their teen years, would that be admissible? Um, it might be. I mean, here's I think here's the biggest thing you get from this is anytime. Look, when, when you have a criminal defendant, the one thing you say to them is keep your mouth shut. Just keep your mouth shut because the things you think are going to help you are going to hurt you in the end because you're going to be tied to what you said. And so when you open your mouth and start to suggest that you are in specific locations, such as he's suggesting, it opens the door to witnesses coming in and saying, oh, yeah, I saw him there. And he was raping a woman or he was attacking a woman or he was inebriated being inappropriate to a woman. So now he's tied himself in to those specific times of which now witnesses are saying that he did something completely abhorrent. Um, And so I don't know why he feels the need to open his mouth. I would kill to be cross-examining him, um, but um, unfortunately I'm not going to get that chance. All right. Um, uh, Julie, stand by. Uh, We're going to be joined uh, by CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman. She's going to join us on the phone. But, uh, Ricky, before we get to a question for you, I want to go back to Nancy real quick. Um, Nancy, if the Senate Judiciary Committee chooses, for all extents and purposes, to ignore this allegation, I don't know that they can, but if they choose to move forward tomorrow with this hearing, can the Democrats raise questions about this third accuser in the hearing tomorrow? Or... Would that be considered out of line since none of the some, none of the people involved are there? Democrats can ask about anything they want. Mm. They, um, you know, that's their prerogative as, as senators. Um, they obviously um, would pose more of those questions to Kavanaugh himself rather than to Ford, although they, they could certainly ask her as someone who attended at least one party with Kavanaugh herself, if she had ever heard anything about that, um, or if she felt that what happened to her was um, it was an attempt to do something along the lines of what Swetnick is outlining um, happened to her, uh, clearly a larger party. Um, and and, uh, and Republicans ostensibly could ask the same thing, although uh, I think it's likely that most of them will steer clear. Um, and for a variety of reasons, uh, even though these allegations are, uh, are incredibly explosive, uh, there may be Democratic senators who want to go ahead with this hearing because mm. they want to get Christine Ford on the record, and they want people to be able to 
see her and hear from her, um, which is always going to be more powerful than, you know, seeing a newspaper article in which someone was interviewed and, uh, you know, and a single picture of them in sunglasses. You know, it may be that, uh, you know, that she is a very powerful um uh, uh, you know, uh, provides a very powerful account of what happened to her that makes her story more believable. Uh, it's also possible that, um, you know, that people walk away being underwhelmed. We just don't know. Um, but, you know, I think the combination of, of having now this, this information out, um, and the ironic thing I have to tell you is that uh, even Democrats are kind of keeping Avenatti at arm's length uh, through the early part of this week. He has a um, reputation, fairly or unfairly, here on Capitol Hill as being uh, the Stormy Daniel lawyer, who is um, bombastic and, um, you know, and, and loves a camera. And Democrats, just like Republicans, didn't quite know what to make of, um, of, of what he had put in those emails about gang rape and all the rest. And they were worried, frankly, that he was hurting them uh, because they didn't know if he actually had the, good, the goods to back up what, what he was saying. They don't have a long uh, history with him. But, uh, you know, what he had been saying uh, to me the, the entire time and to others as well is that, you know, he did have a very credible client who was ready and willing to go public and would be doing so within the next 48 hours. And, you know, while he's somewhat new to uh, the political world, and when I when say new, you know, new within the last year or so because of his representation of Stormy Daniels, he's actually a, a pretty successful lawyer who's had a lot of, a lot of victories in court uh, as a trial lawyer. And, um, you know, and what he was arguing was that it, you know, it was not in his interest to hurt his reputation by over-promising when he didn't actually have a serious client who would be willing to come forward at the end of the day. Yeah, that, that was, you know, I'd seen some pundits in uh, conservative media suggesting that the Politi uh, the weaponization, if you will, of Me Too could come back to hurt Democrats uh, because of some of the things that you point out about Michael Avenatti, Nancy. But Ricky Kleeman is joining us. Ricky, you and I talked about this when we first heard that Michael Avenatti was sort of teasing out there that he had a third client. Uh, you, you know, we talked about how he's not the type of lawyer that would risk his reputation. No attorney would risk their reputation uh, at this level of the game if he didn't have the goods. And now it appears, at least uh, on paper, that Mr. Avenatti has delivered. Well, Michael Avenatti uh, announced this, so it's no surprise to me, that he announced it on Rachel Maddow the other night. He was abundantly clear what he had. And he also was abundantly clear that he would do it as an announcement uh, appropriately in within 48 hours at a point where he felt that the victim's uh, safety, his client's safety, was in a better position than it was at the time he announced it on Rachel Maddow. So what he has come up with is exactly what I expected him to come up with. Uh, the graphic detail in uh, the affidavit is not a surprise if anyone was listening or following Michael Avenatti on Twitter. And I have followed Avenatti's work since the beginning of the Stormy Daniels case, day one. He does not bluff. His legal work, in terms of his written product, is always excellent, and he follows through on what he says he is going to follow through. So the fact that we now can read this affidavit in its appalling detail, and one of the things I think that is interesting about the gang rapes that are uh, uh, outlined by the affidavit is it's noted that he, that is Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge, were present. So the interview that Brett Kavanaugh did on Fox News is directly contradictory to even the idea of being present because he has denied that he knew about anything concerning gang rapes from his youth. Yeah, that's what I was you know, thinking about that in this case, because he denied 
just being there, sort of yeah. the most my right. the, sort of the lowest level of accusation that you were at a party with underage drinking and and sort of wild criminal behavior in this case. Um, just the fact that he denied that calls into question all, almost everything else that he said that he stood for. Uh, you well, know, Anna Marie, as, as you know, because I was very clear about it, uh, whether we were on or off camera, I thought that the interview on Fox News was a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. It was ill-advised um, that no matter how well he may have come across, the reality is that it is a lawyer's dream to have material for cross-examination. How do you get that material? It is because the witness makes a prior statement. So now you have all of these prior statements that were made on Fox News. They cannot be erased. And therefore, this is fodder, as Nancy Cordes correctly points out, that the Democrats, they may have five minutes each. But nevertheless, they have the ability to use those five minutes in a very effective way by whatever means they decide to divide up their time. You have a very good cross-examiner in Kamala Harris. This is from her world. So uh, the Fox News interview was a terrible mistake. You know, I'm sort of curious um, about sort of previous uh, nominees and when it was under under what circumstances they removed their name from the nomination process. The one I can only remember is Harriet Meyer. She was uh, nominated by President George W. Bush. Uh, she was a personal friend of his and of his family. She worked in the White House. Uh, she had very little understanding of constitutional law. Mm -hmm. And I think even before she got to the Senate Judiciary process, um, and you know, Nancy and Ricky and, and Julie, if you guys remember this, um, I'm, I'm sort of using my own memory here, but I remember Harriet Myers didn't even get to the floor of the Senate, even from the committee level, because um, she chose herself to withdraw her nomination, um, and the president accepted it because it turned out that she just she'd been more of like a a pal. Uh, she, she was, well, she was a lawyer, a, but she was like she worked in an right. office and but she, she had managed never been a judge. the office. She had never been a judge, right. and she never you know judged cases. Um, and so that's the only I mean in modern times that yeah. I can remember, but there may have been others for sure. Um, Nancy, can you recall? Can you recall under what circumstances we, uh, 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 perhaps a Supreme Court nominee has removed their name? Or has that ever happened? Has withdrawn? Yeah. Sure. Sure it has happened before. I mean, um, you know, people have, Supreme Court nominees have, like Myers, have withdrawn their, themselves from consideration for far less uh, explosive reasons right. than, mm -hmm. than well, this that, one. That's a great point. I mean, I don't remember how ultimately Robert <laughs> Bork came to be, uh, how the, he was removed from um, the nominating process, but I know that there was a lot of questions about uh, his beliefs and his interpretation of the Constitution, but I don't recall anybody ever having allegations as explosive as these. Um, perhaps there were, but I, I just... I, I wonder if we're now sort of permanently changing this process, right? You know, Nancy, you talked about the fact that, you know, with an FBI sort of vetting, the FBI vetting process probably didn't include what you did in high school. In fact, people are on Twitter, and, I, you know, this is Twitter, but some people are suggesting who are law enforcement that the FBI doesn't actually look at stuff before you're 18. All right. So, may, do, Nancy, do you think we could be seeing a change here? I mean... If, uh, if Brett Kavanaugh, you know, decides that he doesn't want to go through this process and removes his name, the next person who's chosen, I'm sure, is going to look back into their high school career, if you could call it that, to figure out, you know, what missteps or misdeeds they might have participated in. Do you think what we're seeing now is a, a permanent change in how Supreme Court justices are chosen that, yeah, you know, it does matter what you did at 17 from now on? You know, I think that this is a very particular situation, and I'm sure that he was asked, um, even before he was formally vetted by the FBI, when he was vetted by the Federalist Society or uh, when he spoke to the White House, I'm sure they asked him, is there anything in your background that would be embarrassing? Uh, that is sort of like your right. basic introductory question. Are there going to be any surprises in your background? And there might be some people, if if this was in their background, even when they were a teenager, who would be reluctant for this very reason to subject themselves to scrutiny and would say, you know what, I'm you know I'm, I'm happy with the position I'm in. I don't think I want to go through with it. So I don't know that this one case 
is uh, representative of a whole sea change right. because I think that, you know, we don't have Supreme Court nominees that often, and every single one of them is different. I mean, look at look at Neil Gorsuch just last year. He also went to Georgetown Prep. And he is uh, pretty close in age to Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, I don't know that they went into his high school background, but certainly no one came forward to say that he had done anything like this. So every single nominee is is different. And I think, um, you know, a, a charge of shoplifting when you're a teenager, uh, that some background check might turn up is a lot different than a charge of gang rape. Julie, so, yeah. you wanted to chime in here on that. Julie, now, can, you know, it, we're not we're not talking about the typical 17 year old behavior, I assume. Um, he's not being accused, as you had said, of, of a simple shoplifting that, quite frankly, most people would say, I was young, I made a stupid mistake. This, his behavior, if, if we believe it to be true, is so incredibly abhorrent and so, um, so against everything that we should be believing in in terms of who our justice is. Remember, he's going to be making decisions about rights of women, um, you know, as a Supreme Court judge. And so we can't ignore that. And I don't think we could ever ignore that. I think the difference here is he had done things, if we accept them to be true, that are so incredibly unacceptable that make it impossible for him to sit as a Supreme Court judge versus other people who have, you know, little things that perhaps are their little secrets that wouldn't be relevant um, to a decision maker. Just to point out again, these are allegations and CBS News has not confirmed these allegations. So we just uh, uh, are seeing a note here, and Nancy, this I mean, you've seen it as well, um, so we'll relay that to our viewers. Uh, this comes from the Senate Judiciary Committee Communications Director. This morning, Michael Avenatti provided a declaration to the Judiciary Committee. Committee lawyers are in the process of reviewing it now. Um, and as Anne-Marie points out, these are allegations, but I, I want to, because if our viewers are just tuning in, to CBSN right now, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, the news that attorney Michael Avenatti had been suggesting uh, all week long that he was going to provide to the Senate Judiciary Committee and to the media is of this third accuser accusing uh, Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of explosive uh, instances of sexual misconduct, if, uh, essentially. And I'm going to read just from her affidavit, her sworn affidavit that she has provided to Mr. Avenatti and Mr. Avenatti has provided uh, to the press. Um, in one of those paragraphs of her affidavit, this is, and what I'm reading from here is, I guess, what would be considered the least volatile or least explosive of the allegations. But just again, to point out why there were so many people who were concerned that Mr. Uh, Kavanaugh would be given a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court and would have the power and the decision making over the lives of some 400 million Americans, including women, obviously. So in one of the paragraphs, she states this following the first introduction, I attended well over 10 house parties in the Washington, D.C. area during the years 1981 to 1983, where Mark Judge. Mark Judge is the man who is uh, Brett Kavanaugh's friend, uh, and Brett Kavanaugh were present. These parties were a common occurrence in the area. On numerous occasions at these parties, I witnessed Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh drink excessively and engage in highly inappropriate conduct, including being overly aggressive with girls, not taking no for an answer. This conduct included the fondling and grabbing of girls without their consent. I observed Brett Kavanaugh drink excessively at many of these parties and engage in abusive and physically aggressive behavior towards girls, including pressing girls against him without their consent, grinding against girls, and attempting to remove or shift girls' clothing to expose private body parts. I often witness Brett Kavanaugh speak in a demeaning manner about girls in general, as well as specific girls by name. I also witness Brett Kavanaugh behave as a mean drunk on many occasions at these parties. That is just the seventh paragraph, yeah. it goes on with... You know, it, sorry, just to interject, I mean, part of the reason why those, you know, as you pointed out, are sort of the least explosive allegations, but part of the reason why they're still important is because they directly contradict what uh, Brett Kavanaugh said in his Fox News interview, right. and also what his friend um, uh, Mark Judge says, yes. who sort of dismissed their relationship and said right. that he'd never really seen, you, uh, you know, Brett Kavanaugh at these sort of parties behaving in this sort of way, and so this directly contradicts what both of those and men And that's why say. I read that first, because I, I sort of think that we have 
have him on the record, Julie, in that Fox News interview, suggesting that he's essentially a choir boy, that he goes to, you know, he went to church and he hung out yeah, with his and, parents. Mm -hmm. Did you agree with Ricky Kleeman's take that this was an ill-advised interview? Absolutely. I, and again, and I, I agree with her when we say that as, a, as an attorney, you tell your client not to say a word because anything you say is going to be used against you. And even those things you say that you think are innocent or going to make you uh, be portrayed as someone, as you described as the choir boy, are going to come back to haunt you because now, A, we have the ability to cross-examine you on things you said before. And now we have other witnesses that are specifically contradicting things that he said in that Fox News interview in and of itself. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly going to be even more difficult for him, uh, certainly if you have some good cross-examiners in there. So you've got, all right, so Julie, stand by. Nancy, please stand by. I hope you can, uh, because joining us on the phone right now is criminal defense attorney Vinu Varghese. He's also a former prosecutor. All right, Mr. Prosecutor, you're receiving this. You're representing uh, or you're looking at this information. You're looking at um, uh, this affidavit. And now you're not as a prosecutor. You're as a criminal defense attorney. You've got to represent Mr. Kavanaugh. What's your take? I think first, uh, the timing is suspect. And I think you have to look at that, right? I mean, this, these hearings have been going on for a while. And this isn't the first time that Judge Kavanaugh has been before the Senate. He was up for the confirmation process for a circuit, the D.C. Circuit. So you have to look at that from that perspective. That being said, because of the amount of uh, – because now the number of accusations, there are three – separate accusers, and because of the seriousness of this particular allegation, there is, I think it warrants an investigation and a delay in the process for this to be fully vetted. I think Kavanaugh, I mean, people have to still respect Kavanaugh and say, look, the guy has to be presumed innocent. He must be. That's the bedrock of our institution. All these other things um, at this point, the, the timing the fact that you're talking about stuff from 35 plus years ago, I think all of that weighs into the total equation. But at this point, all of this merits, it, it has to merit investigation because we are talking about the U.S. Supreme Court. Ju Julie, I've always been curious about that sort of tack that some of Mr. Kavanaugh's supporters, including members of the Senate, have taken, which is these are allegations from 35 years ago when they were teenagers. You know, all of us, I mean, any reasonable person would say that, you know, when you're a child, which is what you are before you're 18, you do stupid things. But not all of us would suggest that some of the things that are alleged here are typical of an American or anybody uh, in whatever country. But I'm always curious by, by the idea, well, this happened 35 years ago. Somebody brought up the point to me that, you know, when victims of, of the priests who have abused, uh, sexually abused children, finally come to grips and are willing to go on the record with the allegations that they may have been inappropriately um, aggressed by priests, we don't say to them, well, this happened when you were seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, so they can't be true. Prosecutors take that and they try to figure out what happened. Well, well, here's the thing. Whether something happened 35 years ago or it happened yesterday, as a prosecutor, you have to look at um, each specific case and make a determination as to the credibility. It doesn't matter. You know, you can have someone who, who says something happened yesterday and they're lying about it. So the fact that it happened 35 years ago is obviously something to consider. But you also have to consider why it is. And if the victims give a valid and credible reason as to why they didn't come forward, then, then it really doesn't mean anything. Now, keep in mind also that, you know, we did live in a different time 35 years ago um, where some of this behavior was either acceptable or remember, you know, you're, if you're a woman who is attacked by one of these young men or abused by one of these young men, they had an entire school of boys that kind of, as far as they were concerned, stood behind them. And so it may have been incredibly difficult to step forward. Um, I do want to say one thing when we talk about presumption of innocence. This is not a criminal trial. Good this point. is not a criminal trial where the presumption exists. And so when we talk about these affidavits, it's not going to be a beyond a reasonable doubt situation. It's, is there credible evidence? enough to establish that Kavanaugh should not be sitting as a Supreme Court judge. We're not telling him he has to go to jail. We're telling him he can't serve on the Supreme Court, which makes decisions for the rest of his life. That's the difference.
You know, you brought up something uh, sort of interesting about 35 years ago. One of the things to factor in or to consider is that it was a different time. And I want to ask Nancy about the fact that we are in the Me Too era. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about Bill Cosby, who is, you know, spent the night in prison, who's going to jail for several years, uh, and the very accusation is that he participated, not witnessed, but he drugged women and sexually assaulted them. You know, those allegations came up before this era. And, but it's only now that you, they were able to prosecute and, and convict him. I'm wondering, you know, what you, what, how you feel about how the Me Too movement and the era that we're in factors into what's happening here with Brett Kavanaugh. Well, I think that uh, it is a, a huge factor in the fact that so many Democrats and some Republicans said from the outset, even after just one woman came forward, um, I believe her or I think that we need to explore what she's saying. Um, if you think back to 20 years ago and um, and either Cl President Clinton's impeachment proceedings uh, or even further back when he was accused of uh, lewd behavior by a couple of women in his past, um, Democrats didn't want to believe it, and so they didn't believe it. They, by and large, chose that they would believe him over uh, these accusers, and they looked for various reasons why um, these women were unreliable. And that still happens, but the uh, overwhelming presumption now is that, you know, it is very painful for women to come forward, and if they are coming forward, um, you know, it is not open and shut, but they deserve to be heard because there's a very strong chance that there is at least something to what they are saying. And certainly when you start to hear from more women, um, you know, that, meet, that makes each woman even more believable. And uh, I can't stress enough what a uh, volatile situation we are now in. You know, on Monday, a lot of us came to work half expecting that perhaps Kavanaugh would be withdrawing mm. because of the the accusations that had already been been leveled, and that didn't happen. In fact, he and Republicans doubled down. Uh, now we are, you know, now that these new allegations and and you know and very disturbing allegations have been made, anything is possible. Um, you know, Chuck Grassley could come out of his office at any moment and say. Uh, the hearing is postponed. He's uh, opening an investigation. Um, you know, he's conferring with Republican leadership. Anything mm. uh, could happen over the next uh, couple of hours that would influence the um, you know this, this big hearing that we're all expecting to cover tomorrow. That is expected to last the entire day. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh could announce that uh, that he is, is taking a step back in light of these allegations. They doubled down on Monday. Maybe, maybe they've played that card. Maybe they haven't. But I can guarantee you that conversations are taking place uh, in a fast and furious manner across this Capitol and between the leader's office and the White House right now. And Nancy, I know that you've got to go. Please tell your producer, John Nolan, that we're sorry <laughs> that we've kept you here with us for so long, but you've provided such a wealth of information. But John and Nancy, before you go, I just have one final question and then we'll let you wrap it up. Um, Anita Hill, you, you talked about Bill Cosby and the era of Me Too, that the allegations against Mr. Cosby happened before the Me Too era. Well, the 1991 confirmation hearing for Judge Clarence Thomas was well before the Me Too movement. Anita Hill wrote an op-ed in the New York Times and she said this, that the Senate Judiciary Committee still lacks a protocol for vetting sexual harassment and assault claims that surfaced during a confirmation hearing and that it suggests that the committee has learned little from the Thomas hearing, much less the more recent Me Too movement. Um, why has the Senate dilly-dallied, Nancy, when it comes to this? And I'm guessing, I think the American people are hoping that after this, no matter how it ends up, that they will not further do that. Yeah, I wonder, but Nancy, you can answer in a second, but you know, at least with the Anita Hill situation, there was an FBI investigation. Right. You know, I wonder if things have almost moved backwards a little bit, but um, Nancy. Well, uh, first of all, the Senate dilly-dallies on all kinds of things. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's not like they are uh, specifically putting this off. They're putting all kinds of things off. 
um, most mostly because uh, Senate Republicans have been primarily intent on using their time on the Senate floor to confirm as many judges as possible before the midterm elections. And so you haven't seen much extraneous legislation make its way to the Senate floor, um, like legislation that would change the rules of sexual harassment uh, reporting in Congress, because they simply just don't want to take up a couple of days uh, on the Senate floor that they could be using to confirm yet another conservative judge. They don't know if Democrats are going to take control of the Senate, and that window will close. So they want to get as much of that done right now as they can. Um, beyond that, you know, there is a um, there is a bit of self protection going on, and this worry that they will somehow um, give up too much power to primarily women, but also men who might support uh, who might report uh, sexual harassment by. Um, a colleague or uh, even by a member of Congress. And, you know, there are concerns about false reports that can, uh, you know, that can create a lasting stain on one's reputation. And so, um, you know, just simply put, this has not, there are a lot of uh, senators who have paid lip service to the notion of of modernizing the rules, but uh, it is not something that there is a lot of passion for particularly among a lot of the um, older male senators. All right. Uh, Nancy Cordes, our chief congressional correspondent, who has spent the better part of an hour with us breaking down the explosive news out of attorney Michael Avenatti. We thank you. Thank John Nolan for us as well. I know you've got a busy couple of hours ahead before the evening news. And again, tomorrow for CBS This Morning. We always appreciate it, Nancy. Thanks for having me. All right, so a few moments ago, Michael Avenatti was on The View talking about these new claims, and he says that his client is ready to testify. She is willing to testify. Again, she's willing to meet with uh, the FBI forthwith uh, immediately to describe what she witnessed. Uh, she's prepared to provide additional corroborating witnesses' names uh, to the FBI associated with that investigation, and we're hopeful that the committee is going to respond uh, immediately by calling for an FBI investigation so that all of these allegations can be properly vetted and the truth can be known. What if, what if the Judiciary Committee does not respond and they say we're just going to go ahead with the plan, which is to, we'll hear the two of them tomorrow and then vote on Friday. What, what happens then? Well, we have a couple options. I'm not going to disclose what they are at this point in time, but we have planned for that. Although, Joy, I will tell you that I think that would be absolutely outrageous mm -hmm. under the circumstances. There should be no rush to confirm this man to the U.S. Supreme Court, delaying this matter uh, a week or a month or slightly more than a month would be of no consequence. We need to make sure that we get this right, 100 percent right, before a vote in the U.S. Senate is taken on his confirmation for a lifetime potentially to the U.S. Supreme Court. All right, so that was uh, attorney Michael Ravenati appearing on The View just earlier. If you're just joining us here at the top of the hour on CBSN, the news from Michael Ravenati, he has revealed the third accuser, the third person to accuse Supreme Court nominee, Judge Brett Kavanaugh of sexual misconduct. This is the tweet from Mr. Kavanaugh about an hour, uh, excuse me, from Mr. Avenatti about an hour ago. And it reads, this is the picture of my client, Julie Swetnick. She is courageous, brave, and honest. We ask that her privacy and that of her family be respected. You just heard Mr. Avenatti on The View saying that his client is ready to testify. The sworn affidavit that she has provided, which Mr. Avenatti has provided to the members of the media, includes an allegation uh, and I'll just read it because I want to make sure I get my language correct. It says, in part, I also witnessed efforts by Mark Judge, Brett Kavanaugh, and others to cause girls to become inebriated and disorientated so they can be gang raped in a side room or bedroom by a train, and train is in quotes, of numerous boys. I have a firm recollection of seeing boys lined up outside many rooms at many of these parties waiting for their turn with a girl inside the room these boys included Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh. Now, in a statement, a prepared written testimony of Mr. Kavanaugh that is, will be, I guess, if the hearings happen tomorrow on the floor of the Senate Judiciary Committee, in part of uh, the statement, the testimony that he's prepared to deliver, it says, 
Sometimes, this is quoting Mr. Kavanaugh in his testimony, the prepared written testimony for the nomination uh, hearings tomorrow, quote, sometimes I had too many. In retrospect, I said and did things in high school that make me cringe now, but that's not why we are here today. What I have been accused of is far more serious than juvenile misbehavior. I never did anything remotely resembling what Dr. Ford describes. On the phone with us is attorney Julie Rendelman, and also uh, also on the phone with us is criminal defense attorney Vinu Varghese. Uh, so first to you, Julie. Uh, I mean, we're, 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 let's reset here at the top of the hour for our viewers. I mean, I've just read um, the one of the more explosive allegations by Ms. Uh, Swetnick in the sworn affidavit, and now we have the prepared written testimony of Brett Kavanaugh. He's only addressing Dr. Uh, Ford's uh, allegation, but right. what's your take on where this goes? <laughs> um, you know, look, I mean, here's the question you have to ask, ask is, if you believe Kavanaugh, if you're one of his supporters, then what's wrong with doing a further investigation to vet the truthfulness of these witnesses? You know, if we're if the point is to try to garner the truth um, and get to kind of whether or not there is in fact corroboration of this witness or these I'm sorry, these three witnesses, then now is the time to take the time to make it to, you know, to do a thorough investigation to determine whether or not there are, in fact, other witnesses, as this new um, victim has said, um, witnesses or individuals that were there to witness other individuals being either assaulted um, or verbally abused, any of those things. What is the reason in the world not uh, to put this on hold? So I just want to play a little more sound from uh, Michael Evanotti, you know, talking about the seriousness of uh, making an accusation like this. Let's just play that sound. She understands the magnitude of these allegations. She does not make them lightly. She has thoroughly reviewed the declaration. Uh, we have gone over it in detail. She knows exactly what is contained within the declaration. And I'm looking forward to an investigatory process that allows for the truth to be known. The American public deserves to know what happened and about the character, about Brett Kavanaugh. And let me also say this, and then unfortunately I've got to run, but there is no excuse, no excuse for the committee and for Brett Kavanaugh not calling Mark Judge to testify right. for the committee. This is a man that is one of the closest friends of Brett Kavanaugh at the time period at issue and all you have to know is that they are hiding him. They are hiding Mark Judge from the American people. And I can assure you, if he had positive things to say about this time period and positive things to say about Brett Kavanaugh's conduct, we would have already heard from him. All right, Vinu, you've been at your former prosecutor, uh, also a defense attorney. You've been on both sides of this. In regards to Mark Judge, now, um, you know, uh, my understanding is that Mark Judge made a statement the committee didn't think he could add value to uh, his testimony wouldn't add value and so they didn't demand that he appear in front of them but now with all of these accusations Vinu do you agree with Michael Avenatti that really you know they've got to cough them up that Mark Judge needs to present himself in front of the committee I'm not sure if he does or he doesn't. I mean, I think it potentially could be helpful. I mean, he's being named here, potentially helpful to Kavanaugh. Look, um, I, I would say this, the, 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 the allegations here, obviously, of such a horrible nature, it, it, it does warrant further investigation. The, my understanding is that that investigation has to be ordered by the president, by the White House, and it's an extension of the background check, an investigation by the FBI. It'd be just be a continuation of the background check that's already happened. In, in terms of the allegation, though, this is what's important to understand. Just because Michael Avenatti says that she signs this declaration doesn't make the declaration true. Just because she signed under the penalty of perjury doesn't make it true. Understand that she's not been subject to cross-examination, and, and just something that Julie said earlier in, in when, you know, several minutes ago, that while this isn't a criminal trial, the allegations are criminal. And so it, it's my belief that if you're going to move forward on a guy or deny him a vote because of these allegations, well, then these allegations need to be vetted properly and held to the highest standard uh, un, under the law. 
which is out of, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. While it is not a criminal case, these are explosive allegations. And you have a man who's passed six, six different FBI checks previously. So now when these things are coming out at the 11th hour, it should be vetted, viewed with suspicion. And I think, and here's where I do agree with Julie, I, I think that Kavanaugh should welcome an FBI check. Yeah, yeah, but, Vito, but hold on one second, Vito. Women, I, you know, I just want to push, is, Vito, I just no want to... way they can be, their allegations are going to be proved true, and there's no way their allegations are going to be proven false. I, I just want to, the, Vito, push the, back a little bit. These were. I want to push back a little bit on the, there's two things. One, this 11th hour, I mean, we spoke to Nancy about that. The, the 11th hour is upon us because that is what the Senate has decreed is the 11th hour. They could take the time to investigate these, as many people have called for. The other thing is... The idea, I just, it's hard for me to believe that a person, a woman, would put these allegations out there um, and not understand the enormity and the risks involved. Generally, 70%, the statistics are valid, 70% of women who are sexually abused um, do not ever report it. They never report it, even when they are faced with the opportunity to do so at much later times in their life. So I think we need to be careful that we're not suggesting that just because this is happening when it's happening would suggest that the allegations are not true. I understand that people can make things up. I understand that there's a lot of politics involved in this, but it strikes me that we have to strike that tone where we don't try to suggest that just because it's coming out when it's coming out somehow means that it didn't happen or that there might not be some some level of truthfulness No, but I think what, you know, people are going to question her statement, right? They're going to rip it apart. They're going to wonder about the timing. And she's sort of acknowledging that she had an understanding of, of or an awareness that there were crimes taking place, right? Over and over again. Right. And she ultimately became a victim of that crime, but she never came forward. And that's going to be one of the one of the questions, mm. I presume, Vinu, you know, you've been a defense attorney. That's one of the questions that, that's probably right. going to be raised. Look, yeah, if, if, uh, let, me, let me address that uh, in first with Vladimir and then, then to you, Anne-Marie. Like, uh, Vladimir, when you, give, when you cite statistics like this, you know, it's Mark Twain who said there are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics, <laughs> right? How would you be able to prove whether 70% of women are, are telling the truth or actually have been sexually assaulted. When you say, use the term sexual assault, that's a term defined in the penal law of each state. So, you know, the only way to prove that something happened is if it actually goes through the process. So when I say the 11th hour, the hearings ended a week ago. And, you know, again, this, I'm not getting into the politics of this, I do believe that the allegations are of such a serious nature, they require further investigation and that there should be a, a, an FBI investigation. What I'm saying, however, is from the point of view of looking at this, people need to take a step back and should not presume that Brett Kavanaugh is guilty. The, the nature of these things, and this is why we have statutes of limitations. Memories get faded, witnesses disappear. You know, people may not remember, and that's why it's important that crimes be properly reported. You can take into the fact that, yes, the allegations of sexual assault of such nature, people may not report it right away. But the fact that she talked, you know, the, 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 the first accuser that she spoke to her therapist in 2012 doesn't mean that Brett Kavanaugh did this 35 years ago. And I think that's the important thing that, that I want to stress here, that, you know, we have to give Kavanaugh the benefit of the doubt, but you know, I think it's to his benefit to have the FBI thoroughly investigate. But what's going to happen is there's, there's no way to prove or disprove any of these claims. And I think you're going to end up with a stalemate, but it requires further investigation at this point. Let me just read the statistics from the uh, Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network when it comes to reports of sexual violence crimes um, and why people generally uh, do not report them. These are the following reasons. 20% fear retaliation. 13% believe the police would not do anything to help. 13% believe it was a personal matter. 8% reported to a different official. 8% believe it was not important enough to report. 7% did not want to get the perpetrator in trouble. 2% believe the police could not or would not do anything to help. And 30% gave another reason or do not cite one reason. So, Julie, to you, I mean, th this notion that... Uh, 
that because these things happened so long ago, because they weren't presented to the proper authorities at the time, and because they are coming out now, which we've, we've, I think the anybody who's spoken on this subject in the last two weeks or so has understood that it has become increasingly political. There's no doubt about mm -hmm. that. But, but I wonder what your take is on it. And, you know, I, I appreciate Benu talking about, like, this presumption, this presumption. Again, these are not, this is not a criminal case. So, and remember, some of the allegations that are being made against him are are not criminal. They are indications that he was a heavy drinker and was disrespectful to women. Those specific, even if we ignore for one moment the criminal charges, even if we if, accept that some of that is true, that in and of itself becomes a question as to whether or not he should serve as the Supreme Court judge. So remember, it doesn't have to be criminal for them to make a vote based on the fact that they think that at some point in his life, he was so disrespectful to women that it makes it impossible for him to make a judgment now in regards to such important things with regards to the law. Now, in terms of, again, when we talk about something happening 35 years ago, yes, any time any individual in a criminal process comes forward and makes an allegation, keep in mind, not just about rape, about any type of crime. It is the job of a prosecutor to vet that witness, vet to make a determination as to whether that person is credible, vet to make a determination as to whether there's corroboration. Does the individual have some type of mental disorder or disease that may cause them to not be truthful? So, of course, they have to be vetted. Um, and we expect that or should expect that they'd be vetted in this scenario. But again, I don't know that we're obligated at this stage to give Kavanaugh the benefit of the doubt. We now have three witnesses that have come forward who have made sworn affidavits and have, had, have been clear that not only they're willing to talk about it in writing, but they're willing to be cross-examined. So I'm not sure at this point he's entitled to that presumption anymore, not in this setting. So, Julie, we know that um, the uh, GOP hired a female prosecutor to do the questioning at, at the, yeah, the <laughs> yeah tomorrow. Um, her name's uh, Rachel Mitchell. Uh, I imagine she is ferociously rewriting whatever her her plan was in terms of uh, questioning both Judge Kavanaugh and uh, Dr. Ford. I mean, what do you see her role as right now? And and you just how dicey mm -hmm. is this moving forward for her? Well, it's funny, you know, and I think we can all agree it's interesting that they went and chose not only a prosecutor, but they chose a female. And I think that was purposeful um, because I think that when we think back to Anita Hill, when she was surrounded by a bunch of men asking her the most inappropriate questions, I think we're, it's all, as far as I recall, a cringeworthy moment. So I think that they're certainly trying to lessen it by bringing in a female. But female or male, you have to be incredibly careful how you cross-examine this individual. Because if you go at her too aggressive, you're going to turn off the viewers. And when I say the viewers, the people that are in that room watching. And if she is uh, one of those type of individuals that's quiet or soft-spoken, it may actually, being too aggressive to her, may actually lend credibility to what she has to say. So I think male or female, they're going to have to be super careful in how they cross-examine this individual. Yeah, I don't know if hiring a woman, I know that the concern was, you know, the optics that you didn't want a group of older men, uh, you know, grilling a sexual assault victim, but I don't know if hiring a woman is really going to make much of a difference. It, it quite possibly sends the message that these group of men don't have the ability to, in a reasonable, responsible, compassionate way, question a victim. Yeah. Well, I think it. I think there is this level of kind of. It's a little transparent uh, to you know to pick a woman, um, and and not to say that a woman can't handle the job. I'm, I'm sure she can, but if she's too aggressive, then she's not going to be. Um, the, I, I don't think the fit here is an incredibly aggressive cross examiner. I think it's a, a cross examiner that knows how to listen and knows how to calmly bring the uh, victim through the case to try to poke holes in her story. And so she has to be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly careful how she 
you know, kind of navigate that cross-examination. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's also surprising, and I think both of you, both uh, you, Julie, and Vinu, uh, have during the course of our conversation, there's been so much that has happened um, that uh, we've talked about a lot of things, but I, I believe that both of you suggested now, in light of these recent allegations from this third accuser, that you would want to hear from uh, Mark Judge, who is Brett Kav who was Brett Kavanaugh's best friend in high school, because now he seems to be, in almost every instance that these allegations have come out, he is named as somebody who was at least aware of the behavior of Mr. Kavanaugh. And I just went back, because it, it just sort of piqued my memory, and I went back and looked at the New Yorker article that Ronan Farrow uh, wrote with Jane Meyer that came out uh, this week, and they interviewed uh, Mr. Judge's girlfriend, and in one of the uh, quotes here, um, her name is Elizabeth Razor, she dated Mark Judge for three years. This is quoting from the New Yorker article. She recalled that Judge had told her shamedly of an incident that involved him and other boys taking turns having sex with a drunk woman. Razor said that Judge seemed to regard it as fully consensual. She said that Judge did not name others involved in the incident, and she has no knowledge uh, that Kavanaugh participated, but was disturbed by the story and noted that it undercut Judge's pro protestations about the sexual innocence at Georgetown Prep, which is where um, both he and Mark and Brett Kavanaugh went to, to high school. So you and Vinu do agree that at this point you would recommend to the Senate that they at least hear from Mr. Judge? Yeah, I don't, you know, I'm probably not as interested in hearing from Mr. Judge. And the reason I have to, uh, I have to be honest at this point is I don't believe he's going to tell the truth. Oh, wow. And so um, That's interesting. You know, uh, in front of the Senate. I mean, you can go to jail for lying to the Senate. Uh, yeah, but, you know, you have to remember also that it's difficult in this setting to disprove what he's going to say, mm. um, because we're not going to have DNA evidence. We're not going to have video. We're not going to have those things that potentially we would need um, to prove that he's not being forthright. Now, I believe part of the reason he's not coming in is because I don't believe that he thinks he can tell the truth. Mm. Um, but I don't know at the end of the day if he is going to make or break this case. I think it's the, again, I think we all go back to the idea that this should be further vetted and we shouldn't be rushing to, um, you, know, you know, certainly if we were on trial with this case, we sure as heck wouldn't be rushing to try it tomorrow when we just found out about an additional complainant coming forward today. Um, and so certainly we would expect that when there's a decision of this importance, uh, when it's determining who's going to be someone who's going to make him be making these decisions for his entire lifetime that we can give it a little time. But I think what's most important is hearing from the various witnesses, which are the, the, the alleged victims in the case, and then anyone that could corroborate and support what they say. Now, if the, if the Republicans, and I, you know, or if Mr. Kavanaugh thinks that Mr. Judge can credibly come in and vouch for him, then by all means, one would think they'd want him to. But then he's going to be subject to cross-examination. So I just want to uh, read a statement by uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, Democratic leader uh, Chuck Schumer. Republicans need to immediately suspend the proceedings related to Judge Kavanaugh's nomination, and the president must order the FBI to reopen the background check investigation. There are now multiple corroborated allegations against Judge Kavanaugh, uh, Kavanaugh made under the penalty of perjury, all of which deserve a thorough investigation. I strongly believe Judge Kavanaugh should withdraw from consideration. If he will not, at the very least, the hearing and the vote should be postponed while the FBI investigates all of these allegations. If our Republican colleagues proceed without an investigation, it would be a travesty for the honor of the Supreme Court and our country. Vino, Vino, you have uh, expressed um, the assertion that, you know, Judge Kavanaugh is innocent until proven guilty, and, you know, this is not a court of law. But I, I have to wonder, because that he's trying to be a Supreme Court justice and not anything else, Perhaps, he'll, he'll go back to his life if he withdraws. I wonder if he will be able to go back to I being a judge, right? But but do you think perhaps, um, though, of course, the presumption of innocence is always there, the fact that he is attempting to be a Supreme Court justice makes this case just a little more sensitive? I, I'd agree with that. I mean, look, he, he's, he's getting a, you know, this is the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. It's a lifetime appointment. But understand, he already has a lifetime appointment. Right as the Court of Appeals judge in, in D.C. So this is just, this is obviously the, the, the you know, the zenith of, of, 
of a, a lawyer's career to be chosen to be on the Supreme Court. I, I, I think that, you know, Chuck Schumer, uh, I, I'm not saying, I don't believe that Judge Kavanaugh should withdraw his nomination. However, I do believe that there, this warrants further FBI investigation. Um, you know, and, and again, this is while, you know, Julie and I, uh, you know, uh, I agree while it's not a criminal case, it is, he's being accused of crimes, you know, with, with this allegation that he was involved potentially in a train and, and that he, he sexually assaulted. Uh, well, we we should we should just clarify because in her statement, I'm not sure if we lost Venu, but in her statement, yeah, okay, she says that uh, you know that she had been sexually assaulted, and uh, Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh were present. present. She doesn't accuse them of assaulting her. She says that she was aware of sexual assaults going on in side rooms or bedrooms. She doesn't say she witnessed them, but she saw young men lining up to take their turn, and in those in that lineup, often she saw. Brett Kavanaugh and Mark Judge. And we should point out that uh, we are keeping an eye on Mr. Avenatti's Twitter feed. Uh, Gabriel Sherman, who's a correspondent at Vanity Fair, uh, well sourced within the White House, uh, tweeted this earlier. He says, White House shocked by Avenatti claims, privately aides involved in nominations saying this could be the end of the line for Kavanaugh, her outside advisor briefed on discussions. And again, this is coming from Gabriel Sherman. He's a reporter for Vanity Fair. Um, Michael Avenatti responding to that tweet says this, this shows how incompetent the White House is. They must not have been paying attention in the last seven months. Guess their chief information sources are Fox News, Tucker Carlson, and 4chan. So uh, essentially, the, the assertion by Gabriel Sherman in talking to his sources at the White House, Julie, is that even though Avenatti had been talking about this and it appeared on television to uh, sort of tease the news that he had made contact with a third accuser, they are still shocked by this, and the thinking, at least according to Gabe, is that uh, this may be something that sinks this potential nominee. Well, I, you know, there, there is a time and a time when it's time to cut your losses, and one questions at this point, or one wonders whether this is not that time. Um, you know, they remember if they push this too hard, and these witnesses come in and they're credible, um, and Kavanaugh is not, then it you know, it causes them problems, not just in this situation, but who their next choice is. And so, you know, if they at least can have some appearance of saying, you know what, we don't want to, A, put these women through it. And, you know, we can't stand behind a person who, even um, even if we accept the most severe, even if we were to accept the most severe uh, serious charges aren't true, but that was so um, inappropriate and misguided on his treatment of women um, during that period of time that we're not going to stand behind him, then maybe they'll get a little more credibility when it comes to trying to choose the next person. And so is in, in watching all this play out, it feels to, to me at least that, you know, this is sort of going to play out in courtrooms and in districts all across the country. And I wonder if if some if these allegations that are being made against Mr. Kavanaugh, however it turns out, will this make both of your jobs, you and Vinu, will it make it harder if, for example, you're a prosecutor and now you've got somebody who's not going after a Supreme Court nominee, but who suggests that, for example, a school superintendent or somebody who is, you know, a, a, a state senator um, did something when, you know, 10, 15, 25 years ago. In this era of Me Too, does such a high profile case, does that empower more women to come forward or does it sort of as we pointed out earlier suggest that you know th this there's so much heat and there's so much scrutiny and attention on this from the media and from others and from people who have political you know agendas that this may continue to drive folks who feel that they have a story to tell to not tell that story to lawyers I, I think it makes both sides uh, more difficult I think it makes it more difficult for the prosecutor one because the prosecutor has to look in a sense, it should be more difficult for the prosecutor when we think about Harvey Weinstein and kind of, you know, what occurred or what didn't occur during this whole period of time that amounted to him getting arrested now. There's a lot of questions that are being asked as to why the prosecution dropped the ball throughout those years. So 
So, you know, the prosecutor's job is not just to vet, to make it, you know, to, to not arrest, but also to make determination as to when witnesses are credible, whether they're corroborated, if they are, to go forward if they believe that there's a criminal case against them. Now, as a defense attorney, you know, I think, you know, we're, I'm sure Benu would agree we're, you know, it's, it's made it more difficult in certain ways um, because obviously, um, you know, when you have a less high power client who's being accused of something, you know, one is concerned that the prosecutor is going to treat those cases that they treated less seriously before more seriously now. And obviously, as a defense attorney, you don't want that. Um, you want, you know, these cases to be resolved the way they used to be um, because that's your job as a defense attorney. So certainly, I think it's making both sides a little more conscientious and a little more concerned um, about, you know, what their what their jobs really are. So we have sort of the latest statement um, f from Brett Kavanaugh. It's obviously a brief. It's from Russia. Uh, yeah, from Russia. Um, the quote from the judge is, this is ridiculous and from the Twilight Zone. I don't know who this is and this never happened. Well, who this is, according to the sworn affidavit, is a high-ranking government, United States government official who has held the following, and she does point out they're inactive, but top secret clearances for the U.S. Department of State, the Department of Justice, and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, as well as Customs and Border Protection. Uh, Vinu and then Julie, the fact that Judge Kavanaugh comes out with a statement that is unequivocal here, this is ridiculous, and from the Twilight Zone, I don't know who this is, and this never happened. I mean, how easy or how hard will it be able to prove that he actually, let's forget all this other stuff, that he actually knew her or didn't know her? I, I mean, when I see this never happened, the first thing that comes up to my mind, in my mind is, well, which this? I mean, there's so Good many point. allegations in that, in her statement that he said didn't happen, right. um, that others have said indeed that it did. Drinking. I don't even know Drink, what he's... Let's just go with drinking right. excessively. He says this never happened. So far, not just these three accusers, but other people have suggested that uh, he was a heavy drinker. Now, his attorney appeared on our air this morning and said that there are other people who say that he is exactly as he described himself on Fox News. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, Vinu, coming out, I mean, is how, as a prosecutor, as a criminal defense attorney, how hard or easy will it be to just disprove this? I don't know who this person is. Well, as you know, I was saying earlier, I think it's going to be very difficult to prove or disprove these allegations. But that and he I doesn't know her? But that he doesn't know her? I, I, how, how is he going to, how are they going to prove that? I mean, he went to an old boys school. You know, it's possible that he may have been at a party with her. Who knows? Hmm. I mean, it's, it's, this is, this is, I, I understand why Kavanaugh is making these statements, and I think for him, you know, uh, he's all in. Obviously, the Republicans are all in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's making the statement, and, you know, I, I think it's going to be very difficult. But this is where I think the Senate should take a break and set up new hearings and, and conduct a, a, the investigation. I think it's, it's just absolutely, at this point, stupid not to. And I get the political, you know, reasons for going forward, but ultimately, you know, they're going to shoot themselves in the foot because if they don't vet these things and this man goes to the Supreme Court, it is, I think there's going to be payback to them in the long run. Yeah, that's, you know, this, there's a lot of talk about wanting to get him on the Supreme Court, A, before the Supreme Court begins, the term begins, but, but more importantly, before the midterm elections. Um, but it, this is... You know, even going as we go forward, we talked about this earlier. There's always going to be sort of a caveat associated with his name. I think these are probably the the most um, scandalous, um, explosive allegations in regards to a Supreme Court nominee that I have ever heard. Um, and I don't know about how he's going to get anybody out from in under the public that. eye. <laughs> right, but I wonder. You know, um, I mean, like being a defense attorney. So we've got this statement. It's a it's a couple of sentences here. But I'm wondering how you would advise a client. And whether you would just say no statements, don't say anything at all. Certainly, that is the course of action you would take, right? But this isn't a normal situation. I mean, this is where Julie and I agree. This isn't a criminal case. This isn't something during an investigation. If, if you know before arrests are made, we tend to tell our clients if they come to us early enough not to say anything and allow the investigation to take its course. Now, we may provide assistance to prosecutors and lead them on certain ways without them speaking to our client. But this is a different situation. He's already testified. He's gone through uh, a hearing. 
you know, at this point, to either withdraw or go go 100 percent ahead. Right. And he's choosing to go 100 percent ahead. And I think that actually they have to do the continue to continue reopen the investigation into his background, into his background, and allow all these people to come forward. Because what may ultimately happen is that when these people testify, um, that they may not appear credible. And this is where I think that the prosecutor that's been hired by the Republicans, I actually disagree with Julie on this. I think that she should go hard on everyone mm. and take that position because this, you you know, their allegations have to be vetted and there's no reason to tip and toe around this. We shouldn't treat people differently because of their gender. If they're making an accusation of this magnitude, well, then they should be subjected to whatever cross-examination any witness who makes such an allegation should be uh, subjected to. Now, whether that's being, if that's being too delicate with them, I think that doesn't serve the purpose. Now, if the objection is to, is to get to the truth, well, whatever that objective, however you do that, you should do that. And, and I think that they should all be subjected. I mean, look, there's going to be basically at the end of this an accounting. Okay, this witness said this. These are the, these are the things that support her position. These are the things that, that, on the other hand, that go against it. So you do the accounting, you get the pluses and minuses, and then the Republicans at that point can make a determination of, you know, do we have more pluses and minuses? At this point, though, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if, if um, there is a pause. I mean, there should be, at the very least. You know, in, in, in the affidavit, Julie, um, Ms. Swetnick says this in uh, paragraph 13. In approximately 1982, I became the victim of one of these, quote, gang or quote, train rapes, where Mark Judge mm -hmm. and Brett Kavanaugh were present. Shortly after the incident, I shared what had transpired with at least two other people. During the incident, mm -hmm. I was incapacitated without my consent and unable to fight off the boys raping me. I believe I was drugged using quaaludes or something similar placed in what I was drinking. And the reason I highlight that paragraph is because, as Anne Marie has pointed out, and as we've been discussing, it does not say that Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh participated, but that they were there. She says Correct. that she was drugged, that she was unable to give her consent, and she was unable to fight off the boys that were raping her. She believes, and this is just her assertion, that she was drugged using some either quaaludes or something else placed in what she was drinking. I mean, if you're, for lack of a better word, cross-examining her and you're this um, person that the Republicans have chosen to examine and to, t uh, to, to talk to, um, for example, um, Dr. Ford, I mean, how do you take that paragraph and what do you say to somebody who says that they were a victim but that they were incapacitated, they were drugged, they remember two individuals being there, but that's all that they have to go on. It happened 30 plus years ago. Right, so, so let's be clear. When we talk about how we're going about cross-examining a female, a male, no matter who it is, we're not talking, we don't, it, the relevance isn't whether it's a male or a female. It's, you have to know as a, as a prosecutor and defense attorney who the witness is and your, and, and who that witness is and how they're going to portray themselves and how they're going to behave, whether it's on the stand or in a hearing, is going to dictate how you cross-examine them. You can be aggressive with a witness without yelling at them and without insulting them. And so, as we know from prior hearings, a lot of uh, attorneys and non-attorneys just don't know how the heck to get someone or cross-examine someone the right way. And so we have to, again, be very careful, and this woman has to be very careful when she's cross-examining, how to toe the line. It doesn't matter if she's a woman or a man, but she has to recognize that, um, you know, that being too aggressive with certain witnesses can backfire. Now, when it comes to these specific allegations, obviously the questions you're going to want to ask her are not just about, you know, that day, but kind of that period of time, you know, like in terms of trying to determine why she didn't come forward and, you know, kind of who she told and, and kind of what surrounded her at that time. The problem that the cross-examiner has is a lot of the questions she may ask will give answers that are going to hurt her. Because, for example, if I say, you know, hey, um, who did you tell? And she names two people 
then potentially you have two witnesses that are going to arguably corroborate what she said. So you're hurting your case when you do that type of cross-examination. Um, so it is not an easy cross-examination. I don't envy her. I certainly wouldn't mind doing it, um, but it's going to be tough. I also want to add one thing. When we talk about kind of the stigma regarding, um, you know, Mr. Judge Kavanaugh, you know, when I talk about, you know, Clarence Thomas to my children, I, the first thing that comes to mind, and remember, the allegations against him were not as serious, is a Coke can. That's what I think about every time. That's the only image that stays in my head. Just imagine what would happen if Kavanaugh became a Supreme Court justice. Can I just ask also, Julie, um, what, and Vino, you can jump in on this too, what should we, the public, be looking for when we watch the cross-examination, not by members of the Senate, because we know that, that will, there will be some level of politics involved there, but from this person who supposedly is meant to be bipartisan or, or neutral, um, what should we be looking for to see if she's at least, and to, Vinu, to your point, she can be tough. I don't think anybody's expecting her to not be tough, but what should we be looking for as we listen to her, as we listen to her questions, I mean, her probing, to indicate to us that she is being fair, and what should what would be a red flag to suggest that she's not being fair to either uh, Dr. Ford or to Judge Kavanaugh? Julie, you can go first. Oh, oh I was going to say, Manu, do you want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, well, I, I'll, I'll go. Uh, I think it's just she should, the prosecutor who's going to be doing the questioning, uh, you know, she's got to gather information and, you know, that, that's part of it, and, and Julie raises a good point that there may be other people that she that she talked to. This is this is a tough position for this uh, prosecutor to be in because you know most of the time the prosecutors have had background information. They've talked to witnesses, and um, you know it doesn't appear they'll have that opportunity here. So look, in terms of what you're going to be looking for, you're going to be looking for evasiveness, the ability to answer questions, um, direct questions, and. You know, she's going to ask him, well, why didn't you go forward? Okay, well, where were you during this period when he was up, for, you know, for Senate confirmation back in, um, you know, when he became a judge and circuit court judge? And, and the question, look, I think there's another issue here. Since there have been six FBI background checks in this guy that Kavanaugh has, has gone through previously, you've got to reexamine those checks. And I don't think either Republicans or Democrats should proceed without reexamining those checks, because did these people come into the crosshairs of the FBI previously? Were they ever questioned previously, or were people around them questioned? And if, they, if people around them were questioned, and there was no allegation of this back way back when, and presumably there wasn't, because he's, you know, this never came up when he was appointed to uh, be the D.C. Circuit Court judge. Well. You know, if they were, if they were, or, or nearby, or available to be questioned, like why didn't this come up earlier? So that question is, why didn't it come up? Because she didn't want to talk about it for 30 years. Well, I, I think you know, listen, there can be sympathy to a point, but there has to be vetted, and this is again why it's important to look at everything else around it, why there are the statutes and limitations, and why they're important. Vinu, you know, Rachel Mitchell is also going to have to question Judge Kavanaugh. And one of the sort of hallmarks of these um, confirmation hearings typically is that the judge is somewhat evasive. Uh, they're vague about he, where they stand on uh, hot button issues. He was particularly gonna skillful here, at though. that's not going to fly. It, that's I not going to fly, gonna right? Unequivocal here. Say that again, Vinu. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I, I think, I, yeah, no, I don't think he will be vague because if he's vague <laughs> here, he's done. Right? Yeah, he's because be because done. right, and, and I think he's going to be clear. He's going to be unequivocal here, as he has been in his quotes. But here's the thing: I would be shocked if it gets to that point. So, Julie, do you, I, think uh, that, uh, I think there's just too much going on right here for this to continue at present. Let me just quickly read the president's tweet, Julie. Before you go forward, the president just tweeted a minute ago in response to this. Avenatti, Michael Avenatti, is a third-rate lawyer who is good at making false accusations like he did on me and like he is now doing on Judge, Ka Judge Brett Kavanaugh. He is just looking for attention and doesn't want people to look at his past record and relationships, a total low life. Um, okay, so that's the president's response thus far. So, Julie, you were going to sort of pick it up from uh, where Vinu left off. What were you going to say? I, 
I hope to gosh I don't have to respond to that. No, no, it's okay. it, always, it seems to dumb. It always seems to dumb it down. Um, uh, where, where, where? Oh, I think that the issue is when you talk about kind of what we're looking for. Remember, any time you are cross-examining someone, you aren't neutral. You are looking to catch them in a lie. And so, you know, whether it's for a political reason or whether it's just simply you're a prosecutor who believes someone's guilty or not guilty, you have an agenda when you're cross-examining someone. And so, you know, I'm not sure that the most important and pressing issue is why she didn't come forward sooner. I think the pressing issue is her ability to remember or not remember. And so one of the biggest issues is, was she drinking? You know, like these are the questions you're going to want to ask, because if she's drinking, does that impair her ability to remember? Those are the type of issues that are going to be most relevant in determining whether she got it right in her um, recollection of what occurred. And so I think it's less. And and I think the second issue, of course, is I think bias. Is there something about either the nature of her relationship with him, her political views that may in any way impact her ability to be fully honest? But I think the minute you start going down the road of saying she didn't come forward, this isn't, you know, as the news suggested about this isn't sympathy. That There are facts that, you know, we've talked about in terms of statistically why individuals don't come forward. And we see it. Um, we saw it in Bill Cosby. We saw it in Harvey Weinstein. And we saw it in the Catholic Church. And so that part is not about sympathy. It's about the fact that people don't come forward because of threat of retaliation, embarrassment, and the like. You know, and, and it's funny when we think about it. You know, I was speaking to, you know, a family member the other day, and for the first time I brought up something that happened to me when I was younger that I'd never brought up before because it didn't come into my mind until all this started to happen. It sure as hell happened, but it wasn't something that, you know, I brought with me until this kind of topic started coming up. Let me just, um, Anne-Marie just read the tweet from the President of the United States uh, in part, which reads, Avenatti is a third-rate lawyer who is good at making false accusations like he did on me and like he is now doing on Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Let's just remind our viewers that on August 21st, the President's lawyer, Michael Cohen, reached a plea deal with federal prosecutors in their investigation into that $130,000 payment to Stormy Daniels and a payment to Karen McDougal, both of whom have said that they had affairs with Donald Trump. And in pleading guilty, Mr. Cohen implicated President Trump, telling the court that he paid off Daniels at the dis at the direction, this is quoting from that, uh, from that plea deal at the direction of the candidate for the principal purpose of influencing the election. So I don't know what part of the false accusation the president is talking about, but in terms of what he says there, like he did on me. Right, right. We, well, should, we wanted to point that out. Um, all right, guys, we are getting uh, down to the bottom of the hour. Uh, uh, Julie Rendelman, um, Vinu Varghese, we thank you both so much for spending time with us uh, to talking about this. Um, the, you know, this discussion is going to continue into the next couple of hours because we're going to be expecting at least to hear from the Senate. We know that they're looking into the affidavit that Mr. Avenatti has made available to the Senate Judiciary Committee. We know Democrats are already starting to respond, but we have yet to hear from Chairman Grassley and from some of the other Republicans. So this is not over by a long shot. We don't even know what tomorrow is going to bring. Uh, yeah, it's so true, but I can tell you, you know, that statement from Brett Kavanaugh saying this is the twilight zone for him and nothing like this ever happened gives us a little bit of an inkling as to, you know, whether or not we'll see him withdraw his name. He seems Indeed. to be doubling down. All right, more to unpack here. We'll have much more reporting on this throughout the course of the day. You are streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. the story that sounds like a movie but it's not have we heard anything from the white house on this there is an incredible amount of news this morning you're watching cbs this morning we thank you for that there is a unique power in truth and whether the story is around the globe look at this or down the street we'll find it it amazes me that you were able to see your house destroyed and you went right back to work because every evening we want to put the power of truth in your hands, the CBS Evening News with Jeff Galore. I'm Bill Whitaker with 60 Minutes. We'd like to speak with Congressman Marino. This is an industry that's out of control. 
We would not have known about this in about 60 minutes. We're going to take it very seriously. They were just drug dealers in lab coats. You know what a chilling picture that paints? The winds are ferocious, gusting above 120 miles per hour. The island is still struggling to recover. And many are wondering if it ever will. Puerto Rico is in the throes of an exodus that's draining the island of its most valuable resource, its people. The most obvious sign of exodus is the number of schools that have been shut down across the island. Después dejó mi papá, mis hermanos, mis amistades más cercanas. Te quiero mucho. The magnitude of Maria was something that was really hard to plan for. I will die trying to make sure that Puerto Rico becomes a place to where we can have opportunity. Toda puerta que Dios abra, yo cruzo. Por ahora, pues, todas las puertas se me están eh, abriendo allá. the CBS Evening News from the hurricane zone. Florence turns it deadly. At 12 noon, high tide rolled in. Right now, you can't tell the rivers from the roads. It's bad. It's a lot of wind, a lot of trees. This is a massive oak tree that was toppled. This is your street. For many of these evacuees, they are hoping that they will still have homes to return to. This is the worst it's ever been. This is scary. This is some of the worst of Florence. Hello, I'm Bill Whitaker with 60 Minutes. We'd like to speak with Congressman Marino. This is an industry that's out of control. If they don't follow the law, people die. We would not have known about this in about 60 Minutes. I did see the report. We're going to look into the report. We're going to take it very seriously. They were just drug dealers in lab coats. You know what a chilling picture that paints? Emmy Award-winning journalist Jeff Glor on the CBS Evening News. What's new under the sun? Good morning. I'm Jane Pauley, and this is Sunday Morning. Go uh, on. You know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> what does it say on that gravestone? Here lies the oldest man that ever lived. Actually, <laughs> the women in your life. Apparently, women just don't like me very much. <laughs> Experience thought-provoking, innovative, and truly original reporting. Hey, Jane. 
because there's always something new under the sun. Please join us when our trumpet sounds again on CBS Sunday Morning. Facebook's head of global safety, Antigone Davis, joins us now. Tell us about the charges that Facebook actively tries to get people addicted. Law enforcement is closing in on a group of thieves that's stolen more than a million dollars from ATMs across the country. Tony DeCoppo shows us how the scam works. There is a new push to crack down on scammers targeting elderly Americans. Mark Bordellini is chairman and CEO of Aetna. Is this going to bring down the cost of prescription drugs? The CBS Evening News from the hurricane zone. Florence turns it deadly. At 12 noon, high tide rolled in. Right now, you can't tell the rivers from the roads. It's bad. It's a lot of wind, a lot of trees. This is a massive oak tree that was toppled. This is your street. For many of these evacuees, they are hoping that they will still have homes to return to. This is the worst it's ever been. This is scary. This is some of the worst of Florence. Well, I look at the second accuser. The second accuser has nothing. The second accuser doesn't even know. He thinks maybe.